Hey guys, I'm Raul here with another episode of Cold Emails Hot Takes. And today, super excited. We have Alex Berman. He has courses, he has YouTube, he's a filmmaker, he has software, best selling author, food critic, posts on Twitter like a maniac. And I think most importantly, I think, like, no joke, you've helped thousands of people pay for rent, pay for food, help their families. And so, like, from the entire Cold Email community, Thanks for everything you've done and happy to have you on the show, man. Thanks, Earl. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. And so I have some cool questions lined up, but before we get into those stuff, we always ask a couple of questions from all the participants in the podcast. So you have so many different things going on. What's the main KPI for you? What are you optimizing for? Right now, the main thing I'm optimizing for is SaaS signups. So we we have this SaaS uh, Taplio, which is the number one priority right now. Um, as we're scaling, you know, I think we're at 35, 36,000 MRR after three, four months, which is great to see. Um, and I know that everything is, is related to that. So for instance, if we're cold emailing for Taplio, then all of a sudden now that cold email learning can go into the course. Or if we show great screenshots of revenue growth for Taplio or even any of the other SaaSes that we're running, now all of a sudden people are joining the coaching and joining that stuff. So I'm very much a, uh, a results focused person in terms of, I know that like if we are doing stuff, the content's gonna be better um, versus being content focused, which a lot of people are where they're creating courses and they're doing all this stuff, but it's, it's mainly copy pasting other people's things. Um, this is actually one thing I love about you guys too. All of your content is real in the field, tested stuff and you're innovative. You know, you've got the spin tax, you've got all these innovations and that stuff only comes from actually doing the work. Yeah. Exactly. So like we're trying to be again, like going after like you, like the content part we've turned like from sauce into more of like a content marketing case right now. It's like good focus, good thing to have. And so because you have like so many things right now, you're focused on like Taplio. Uh, and for us, we feel like all of this success and like money and MR we're making right now only makes sense if we compare it to like what we had before. So like looking back when you start, like what's the least amount of money you remember having in your bank account? I don't know if I had like 20 bucks before. And then I've had to like go to Walmart and try to figure out how to eat <laughs> and all that stuff. Um, but I, I would say it's all, it was all from poor money management on my side, you know, like, cause, cause for me, it always was like feast and famine. Like I'd make 6k and mm. then I'd spend the 6k on one major project <laughs> a lot of times it's art that takes up all my money um last time that was last time i was super broke because i decided to make a movie and it cost seven thousand dollars and i only had like seven thousand in my bank account <laughs> i used every dollar on this yeah, and what happened with the movie that didn't go anywhere <laughs> <laughs> classic I like big money like... stuck that's classic art <laughs> sometimes you put all this time in and then it's not even worth releasing but i'm getting better at that too <laughs> Like that's one of the main things I wanted to ask you. And I was talking with uh, instant disco founders, like what should I ask Alex? And they were like, how the hell are you doing so many things? Like, where did you get the energy? Were you born like this? Are you using a lot of coffee, Red Bull, something else? Like how do you do it? I, how do I get the energy, bro? It's just like, they're, I, I'm fighting. I feel like I'm very much on, on my back leg. I see people even like instantly you guys grew so fast. And I'm like, a, as I see that growth, I'm like, why am I not growing that fast on our SASs? Or I see like cold email wizard blowing up with his uh, cold email course. He hit this nerve. He basically turned cold email into a meme, which I, I was trying to do for five, six years. So I just see all these other people doing great stuff. And then I feel like I always got to catch up. And that's what gives me the energy is like, I'm always I'm always just trying to get on your guys' level, you know, <laughs> everyone else in the space. <laughs> yeah, I love that. But it's like, it's weird for us. Like, it seems like you're the guy, like you're the one we're <laughs> aiming for. And then you still have the chip on your shoulder. So like, how do you keep it there? Like, how do you have your back against the wall? Because I feel so with instantly, now we, we're like bootstrapped. But before I had a, like a failed startup where we invested money. And I felt like when you get the money, you're going to like let loose, you know, we can make it. Like, we don't have that like rush anymore. Like, how do you keep it? when you have those opportunities, when you have the money? So what works for me is big monetary goals. So if I don't have something I'm saving up for, uh, mm -hmm. then I don't try to go for the money. Like right now I'm really trying to, you know, build a family and have a house and like send, if I have kids, send them to private school. And like, th these are all goals I have to stack up, right? Which now makes my burn rate 
you know, I, I'm going to have to somehow find like 30 or 40,000 a month in profit just to support the family on top of savings goals, on top of taxes and everything. Um, so now I'm motivated versus if I didn't have any of those goals and I was just chilling, you know, and I was playing video games and smoking weed all day and my burn rate was $2,000 a month, you know, uh, I would, I would feel no need to, uh, to keep going. And I've been there before, you know, like I felt like I felt retired the first time I started making $3,000 a month, but what is retirement? There's a retirement at 3,000 and there's a retirement at 90,000 uh, a month. You know, I was, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, if I just went back to the life I was living in Wichita, Kansas, you know, $400 a month apartment, I could retire for the rest of my life and never work. And I didn't want that. I'm like, do I want that life? Or do I want the life where I'm in a mansion and driving a supercar and have kids that are in private school and like all this shit? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the one I want. I want the second one. <laughs> Makes sense. And like, that's uh, like what I learned from uh from our first like sales job when we got the like bible of how to get started it said like yeah throw away all old clothes like get a new nice watch get a nice apartment and it, it seemed like toxic before but like now i get it if you level up like you have to keep up with that stuff but that being said so like with your art projects with your like other stuff i heard like with the chatbot thingy you have to like put some things aside have you gotten better at like saying no to things do you have a system for that like how do you get rid of stuff that you don't want to do yeah. Um, so for, for art projects, we always want to do it. Like for instance, on best meals on earth and uh, every burger in Vegas, just this year, I've spent over $20,000 on those channels and the star Wars podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still doing the art projects. I think that's fine. Um, saying no to SAS projects is becoming easier. Um, because right now when I, when I'm screening things out, I always think about, uh, will this be able to hit a million dollars a month? And then do, do I have, um, something that'll take this to the next level. For instance, someone was just pitching me a SaaS uh, yesterday. It was like a task management software for business, something like that. And I was like, one, I'm not really that interested in task management. I just use like a note app. But two, will my audience really like this? Will I be able to push this to you know, 10, 20, 30 KMRR in the first month or two? And if the answer is no, then it's not even worth considering uh, at that point. Because what I've found is all of this stuff balloons out of control. Like, do, did I know I'd be spending $20,000 on YouTube channels that wouldn't make any money? No. Uh, did I know that when I committed to spend 4,000, you know, on season one of every burger last year? No, I didn't know that it would balloon into this thing, but everything does. Same with SaaS. You know, we're, we're, we're soft launching Omni, which is our, our uh, Omni channel sales tool. And I think we're 68, $78,000 in, in the hole on that right now in terms of development uh, and development costs going forward post-launch. Uh, I was just talking to Amit, who's our, our partner there. He wants 12000 12, a month for development. And so I'm like, and I, I see it. I'm like, okay, if we commit to this, we're going to be able to be best in class tool. But did I know that when me and Amit were playing golf and he told me it was going to be 22000 to build the whole tool all in? No. <laughs> so I think that's the other thing I'm starting to realize is like saying yes doesn't mean uh, saying yes to whatever's being offered. It means saying yes to all of the second and third order consequences of everything. Um, similar in SaaS too, like when we started Lead Shark, did I know that if we started a lead generation platform, people like Will Cannon who run Uplead would, you know, remove our free access to the tool or like, you know, like it's, it's like you start something and then you don't realize like all the second and third order consequences. Similar on the courses. I didn't know that like starting certain courses would give me bad blood with certain uh, creative creators out there. Um, so that's, that's what I, that's what I try to do now. Like anytime I'm presented with a project, I try to think of like, not saying yes or no to this, but saying yes or no to how it's going to look in six months or eight months or, you know, two, three years from now. And then only if that looks good, then I'll, then I'll say yes. Otherwise I'll throw it in the trash. It's got to look really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, like, I remember like when we had a call, when we started instantly and you, we had, we had an agency 10 and then we asked about the agency two and said like, forget the agency guys. Like you're going to be working on the SaaS and same thing, just like uh, being flexible not being stuck with an idea just because you put so much money into it. We're getting better at like first time in our lives, we're working on one project. Like we don't have anything else instantly, just that like we gave away the uh, agency, even though it was making money, it was hard, but now it's like, feels so good. And like one of the key things is also mentioned, you have a partner. And I think like a lot of people like maybe don't know this, you seem like this like lone wolf, Alex is doing like all these things, like you're the face of the operation, but you have like really good partner. So can you talk a little bit about how people can find a good partner and uh, like solo entrepreneurship versus having a partner? How does that help you? And how would people like start looking for a partner? 
Yeah. So the partner you're talking about is Robert, uh, who helps on X27 and now at AR Ventures. Um, I found him through Noah Kagan's Make Money Online group back in the day. Like, uh, so that's that's how I would find a partner is do the same thing. I hired him for some work. Um, so if you're in like a course or a mastermind, you're already aligned on the values, you know, of, of making money, of succeeding, of whatever, you know, that guy was pitching on the course. So I would say that's always a great place to start uh, finding like-minded people or inside the paid communities too, because then you know the partner is not some broke person mm -hmm. as well. Like there, there really is a screen to that. Like if you meet somebody in a community that's $1,000 a month, you know this guy at least has $1,000 a month to put into this. So he's not going to do any stuff like stealing or anything like that. Um, I would avoid broke people as co-founders. Uh, you can get broke people as employees for sure <laughs> and then make them rich, which is great. Um, but you really don't want broke co-founders because they're going to make decisions from uh, the opposite of an abundance mindset. They're going to end up stealing from you or doing weird things uh, that you don't, you don't want. So that's that. Um, we have co-founders all throughout the organization now too, like me and Harambe Money uh, do our Venture Mage course. Um, and Harambe, the reason why uh, I partnered with him was he is a cool dude, but he also has this great case study of raising money with cold email. And so that was something we'd never done before. So we decided to partner on that. And he has a great vision. He's worked with a bunch of other influencers. And then Amit uh, and the whole First Principles team who helps us on the back end with building uh, the SaaS is like, like Omni. Uh, I partnered with him also because he was a cool guy, but he was able to run a, uh, a tech team. He was the first agency that told me that the, uh, the hourly rate was like $2.50 an hour, which I always knew it's true. I've run an agency. I know what it is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's the other thing to look for, especially when it comes to a tech partner is try to find one that's not using you as a way to make money. You really want to find a partner that's using the business as a way to make money. So if a tech partner comes to you and is like, yeah, it's going to be $180 an hour, that's an agency. That's not, <laughs> that's not your, uh, your co-founder. And it's, it's stuff like that. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Uh, long-term long -term, uh, is the only real way to find these people as well. Like Rob, me and Robert have been business partners since maybe, I don't know, maybe six, seven years, maybe eight years now. Um, and, and you can only really see this stuff long term because uh, I've had some partnerships fall apart too. Um, we were running this one course called Epic Mail Machine and this guy Michael was, was building out all of our funnels for us. He was doing all this stuff. We were 50-50 co-founders and then after about uh, two months in, he, he didn't like that he was doing all the work and so he sent me an email about that and he, he basically dropped the partnership. Um, but that was a good catalyst for us because I just made email 10K after. He was the one who got us into online courses. Mm. So losing a partnership is good too. Um, but that, that's, a, that's about all, all it is. It's uh, trial and error, keeping your relationship and, uh, and just going for it. It feels like it's similar like with you with the ideas. You just like go out, if you see something cool, just reach out, see what happens. And I feel like more people should be doing that because that's the exact same way how we found instantly... Uh, developer, CTO, like co-founder. It was like a random Reddit post that I did about like co-founder subreddit. And it's like, look what happened now. We even went to like visit him in uh, North Carolina. It's like mm -hmm. a random place, never seen dude, built like a nice house together. And then you finally like meet up in real life. So it's like actually possible. It seems weird, like online dating, but yeah, just like reach out to people, it works. And you mentioned like going after these like masterminds, paid courses, like. How do a guy like you still like learns and stays on the, the cutting edge? Are you buying courses? What are you doing to like improve your own game? I'm buying everything. And I, I basically get in every, everywhere. You know, I took your guy's course. I saw Garam from Lemlist had his free course. I took that. Um, <laughs> I'm implementing these cold email, everything. Like if, if you guys pitch a script, I'm going to send one of those at our company and see if it works. You know, if we see random stuff online that we haven't heard of before, we're, we're testing it out. So that's how, that's how I'm learning all the time. And then I'm, I'm talking to people that are above us and trying to learn from them as well. Um, I've been learning, especially on the SaaS side, uh, Stefan Smolders, who runs Expandy. I was just talking to him about like how to map his thing out or how, how we should map our thing out based on what he did. Um, I was talking to Dan Martell, who runs a bunch of SaaS stuff. So I, I think that's, that's the thing is to, um, to understand how, uh, how small you are in the grand scheme of things, right? You could look at a SaaS that's making a million dollars a year or even something like Taplio that's making half a million dollars a year and think, oh, we won if you compare it to one of these indie marketers. But then you compare it to like a SaaS like Buffer that's making 15 million a year and all of a sudden you're not even really a percentage <laughs> of what they're doing. 
Uh, and so I think that's that's super important is to look at what they're doing and try to aim for for them and not aim for beating even your past self. Honestly, a lot of people like to look at their past self and be like, oh, I'm doing so much better than my past self. I think that's cool. I also like to look at you know the the people out there and say, hey, this guy's doing this. How can I get his results? Um, how come I'm not doing? I, I like the the ego. It's like I'm better than this guy, right? I like thinking about this. I'm like I'm better than this guy, right? I'm smarter than this guy. If, then why why is he driving a nicer car than me? Why is he more successful than me? And why are his business ideas better than mine, right? If that's true. <laughs> so then using that to like talk myself down, and then uh, and then going from there. Gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting because so like you're right now in the like mindset you over like reached the level you're trying to find like new things to motivate yourself but let's say so we have a lot of beginners still like there's so many people like still coming into the online game they're learning about this stuff so let's say you walk down the street you find a homeless dude and he said like alex i'm going to do anything you say for three months you can get to 10k a month what's the game plan what are you telling him what should he do step one is take a shower <laughs> this guy's too smelly uh step two is create an offer, right? I was telling my little brother this, he's trying to get into business. And I'm like, he, he calls it a scheme. He wants to create the ultimate scheme. And I was like, all right, well, the perfect scheme starts with an offer. <laughs> so basically you need to be selling something to somebody. So the homeless guy should come up with, with an offer, probably a marketing offer. Because anytime you're offering people a chance to make more money, it makes it easier to sell. Uh, and then, so maybe it's Facebook ads, maybe it's building a website, maybe it's doing something like that. Those initial services still sell very well. And then step one to make your first dollar is approaching these businesses on your street. You don't have to worry about cold email. You don't have to worry about cold calling or spending on ads. Just walk down the street, business to business to business. Uh, the local ones work a lot better than the chains and just see if somebody will, will pay you. That's how I made my first dollar. I walked into a pizza restaurant and offered to rewrite their menu for a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember the guy, he didn't even have a hundred dollars in cash. He wrote me a check <laughs> for the yeah. down payment of 50 and I stuck it up on my wall. And that's how you got started. Just like door to door salesman pretty much. Yeah. Well, so a lot of people overcomplicate it because you see a tool, you see tools like instantly and these cold email tools, or you see the gurus talking about Facebook ads and spending all this money. But the thing is, that is all level two or even level three thinking, right? Level one, initial thinking, zero to one, is selling your thing to other people. And so if you can't walk into a business and pitch them, you can't do this 10, 20, 30 times until you make a dollar, what makes you think that you'll be able to spend $10,000 profitably on Facebook? Mm -hmm. Or send a thousand cold emails and turn that into a meeting. Because what's going to happen after you send those thousand cold emails? You're going to have to talk to these customers and sell. So all you're doing is delaying the inevitable. Uh, it's similar for SaaS launches. The reason why I feel confident now spending 70, 80K on these SaaSes is because we've done it at a smaller level. And I know that we can build this SaaS and we can turn it into to money and we'll do it on these channels. And we'll talk to these customers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you don't have that, then you, would, then you shouldn't spend the 70K. You should build a landing page, talk to customers and do all that. Um, I, I always think about fast forwarding the money-making process. So for instance, if you tell me that you can't start a SaaS because you need $10,000 to do the development, then my next question to you would be, okay, let's assume you have the development ready, you have the SaaS ready, you have the landing page ready. Now, what's the next step? And a lot of people get stuck there, you know, because the next step is, send traffic to the landing page and they can do that without spending the $10,000. Um, that, that, that is, that's the big thing. A lot of people get distracted and they think that um, they need to spend money or they need all this stuff when really they need to get started. And after they spend the money, they're still going to be sitting on uh, a worthless asset and having to do the, the work that they put off six, seven months ago. And I feel uh, like that's why cold email is so good. Like it doesn't have to be cold email. But it's like one of the cheapest, like everybody can do it. You don't even need, instantly don't need any tool. Just get a Gmail, you can start reaching out, right? And I know you're probably like bored as hell, like talking about cold email, but my Love viewers would be <laughs> like mad if I don't ask some questions about cold email. But so if you look at cold email, people say it's easy, but I feel it's actually like much harder than it seems because if you're a beginner, there are like so many things from the technical side, finding leads, copywriting, campaign management, optimizing all the software tech stack, what do you think from the entire picture 
is the highest leverage activity that people should really learn and understand and like dive into that will give them like much better results compared to learning everything a little bit. All you need are three questions. You need, who's my target offer? Or sorry, all you need are three questions. You need, who's my target audience? What is my offer? And what results do I have to prove that I'm able to, uh, to fulfill that for customers? And from there, everything else is clear, right? If, if I know that my target audience is local restaurant owners in the Charlotte area, now I know how to contact them. You know, whether it's cold email, cold calling, walking in, it's all there. If I know my offer is, you know, I'll generate 40 new customers this week with Facebook ads. Now I have something to, to tell them, you know, whether that's via ad campaign, whether that's via cold email, whether it's via walk-in, whatever. And then if I have a case study, like, hey, I know I can do this because I ran ads myself and we're able to generate clicks for this amount. So I know it's going to translate there. Now I have what I need to close the deal. Um, so that's, that's as simple as you can possibly make it. It's like, who are you selling to? What are you selling? And how do you know it works? And if you can answer those three questions, all marketing will fall into place. Yeah, love that. So just start with the basics. Don't try to figure everything out. Just like start reaching out as quickly as possible and then you'll figure it out. And I feel like this again, people are using like templates. They're trying to do like one thing, but I don't know what's going to work. Probably like you're not going to know what's going to work before you test it out, right? So out of all the tests you've done, you have probably run like thousands, tens of thousands of tests. Do you remember something like that was like really how the fuck did this work? Some like pattern interrupt, like something you didn't believe actually worked. It's no, because it's all, it's all just basics, bro. The way that I sell, I try to treat it like a magic trick. I'm like, if I tell you that I've worked with your biggest competitor and generated these results, you're going to work with me. <laughs> so like, let me try to talk to the competitor and get them to say that I've generated results for them. Then I'll send an email to you. Like, it's all very, very straightforward the way that we sell. That's why, you know, we just do the compliment case study call to action. And that's why I think it works so well. Mm. It's like, you compliment them, you know, Hey, I know who you are. You're, you're awesome. Uh, I've done this work in the past for these guys. And I'd love to do the same for you. Let's talk. Like, I think that works so well, so consistently because of, because of what it is. Um, and so, no, dude, there's no real curveball. The, okay, the biggest curveball that I found was just in the people that are able to loan me their case studies. Like, for instance, me and my little brother started a, a documentary video production company, and we hadn't made documentaries before in our life. Uh, so what we did is we reached out to directors, and what we found is a lot of these documentary and nonfiction directors need work. And so they gave us permission to list their films on our landing page as like, hey, our team made these. Then we reached out to business book authors. And this was our highest performing cold email ever. I don't think I've talked about this too much, but we basically reached out to, it was like 80 people that have all been on this pod, one podcast where a ghost writing agency for these business books interviewed every single one of their customers. So we sent 80 cold emails and I wanna say like 30 or 40 of them replied. And the, the whole thing was like interview, or it was a documentary was the subject line. It was like, hey, really love XYZ book, would love to make a documentary. Let's talk later this week, question mark. <laughs> and that got such good responses. And these documentaries were selling for anywhere between 50 and $150,000 each. So the amount of leads, the, the lead amount we were able to generate from that campaign was like 10 to $12 million of just leads off these guys. Um, so that, that was the biggest curveball. It's, it's not in cold email pitching as much as it is in the entire system. Because I'm not looking at just a cold email. Everything that we're doing, I'm trying to see the entire uh, picture at once. Yeah, I love that. Like it works so well because you customized the cold email big picture for a specific niche, right? Specific like lead source, you didn't use like a poll or something, custom, custom, custom. That's why it worked. And I feel like, again, people are too stuck. Maybe even like what I asked you is like some curveballs, like, oh, well, what's the newest thing that works? Like just the basics, they work, it's proven. But if you can try to find like these little pockets out there that people haven't hit, like, documentary guys i'm pretty sure they get much less emails than like a saw ceos ecom stores right so like finding these pockets might help and business book ceos too or business book writers because they sell none and they're rich enough to afford sixty thousand dollars for a ghost writer <laughs> <laughs> true so that's like if anybody out there wants to do some has some offers book writers go ahead and well even for even for x27 that was it wasn't a huge niche back when we started but we we're selling lead generation to agencies. And the way that I found these agencies was 
a database, which is more popular now, but it's clutch.co. Because what I realized was if you're willing to spend 2,000, 4,000, 8,000 a month to get a sponsorship on clutch.co, you're probably going to hire a marketing agency. And so I was cold emailing those guys and we closed, it was like $600,000 in annual recurring revenue in 30 days, just reaching out to them, you know, with a marketing offer, like, Hey, we did this for Dom and Tom. We made them a million dollars and we'd love to do the same for you. Same offer. Um, and, And that's, that's it, you know, find your lead pool, craft your campaign around that. And you're good to go. That was with no custom first lines or anything. The only customization point was, um, just a, one portfolio item. So like, hey, love the work you did with Power Rangers or hey, love the work you did on Tyson. And that was enough customization for them. Gotcha, that's perfect. Like uh, uh, quote like to the editor, like clip this, we can make a TikTok reel out of this, YouTube short, we're gonna get into that game as well. And those were all the like long questions I had. So the last part is rapid fire, just like some quick questions, don't cheat, answer straight away, like what comes to your head, you ready to go? Copywriting or sales? Copywriting is sales. But like uh, live uh, on call sales or copywriting, like salesmanship in print? So in order to be a good copywriter, you need to be talking to customers. So I think it's two parts of the, of the same coin. Like I wouldn't be able to create a landing page for an offer if I haven't talked to a few customers already. Catch. Coffee or Red Bull? Sugar-free Red Bull. <laughs> one twitter account more people should follow one twitter account i mean they can follow you i've been loving those uh, downloads <laughs> <laughs> thanks man biggest cold email red flag biggest cold email red flag selling an offer nobody wants tiktok or twitter twitter what's going to be the next digital cold rush the next digital gold rush I feel like it's going to be selling TikTok ads to people. Uh, Alex Ramosi or Andrew Tate? Alex Ramosi. Underrated tool that more people should know about? Underrated tool. I feel like not enough people use the Crunchbase lead generation database. It's a bunch of SaaS companies. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like what? <laughs> it should be the biggest one. And final question. You're held hostage and they will let you go if you send out an email and they open it. What subject line are you using? Quick question. <laughs> That's a good way to end it. Classic quick question. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, where can people reach out to you? I'm going to add all the information in the description, but just tell short like what you have going on, where they can find you, and that's it. If you want free content, go to youtube.com slash Alex Berman. And if you want to join the coaching, go on over to email10k.com. Perfect. Thanks so much, man. Take care. Thank you.